All right, so here's a question that Amos asked, and he's going to answer it in three different ways. If Yahweh will uh, judge the surrounding nations that surround Israel for breaking the covenant, how much more will he judge Israel itself for breaking the covenant? And he gives three different answers. Uh, chapters 1 and 2, he gives a message to the nations and to Israel. In chapters 3 through 6, he gives a series of poems that speak directly to Israel and its leaders. And in chapters 7 through 9, there's a series of visions which speak directly about the judgment that's going to come upon Israel and its leaders. And that's the answers that he gives, and we're going to explore that over the next seven weeks. Uh, today, we're going to look at chapters 1 and 2. So now, uh, in, your, in your Bible, I believe in, in verse 1, it says, uh, and you tell me what it says. Some of yours says that Amos was a shepherd. Does it say that? Yes. He was not. I'm going to tell you what it says. There are three different Hebrew words for shepherd. Uh, the, the, the common word for shepherd is roha. That word is not used here. There's another word here called noked. That word is found one other place in the Bible, and that's found in 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, the uh, third verse. And that is a person who owns a flock of sheep. Misha was king of Moab, and he owned a whole herd of sheep. And so what we know about Amos is that he owned a whole flock of sheep. Now, you go to Amos, the seventh chapter, the 14th verse, and he uses another word. It also says that he's a shepherd. That's not right. The word there is boker, and that means that he bred sheep. So Amos was a person that owned a whole flock of sheep who bred them for a specific purpose. And that purpose was for kings and for the sacrificial systems. So that's what Amos was. He was a very rich farmer is what he was. And not only that, he raised fig trees. So in the hills of Carmel, Mount Carmel, he raised sheep. And in the southern uh, valley of Tekoa, he raised figs. And it was a very uh, lucrative business. And one of the reasons that uh, Amos wanted to uh, make a distinction about him being a prophet who was who came from the, uh, the agri uh, who came from a farm community was that he did not want to be associated with the corrupt prophets that were in Israel. Uh, in fact, there were many corrupt prophets in Israel, and they had uh, they had come where they were actually false prophets. We see one example of that in 1 Kings 22. But Amos was going to preach against the northern tribe of Israel. Now, Israel had broken away from, its, uh, from Judah 150 years earlier. Now, we know that from 1 Kings 12, okay? And so, and, Am and, the, and the ruler of Israel at that time was a man by the name of Jeroboam II. Now, his grandfather was Jeroboam I, and Jeroboam was a wicked king, and so was Jeroboam II. He was a very wicked king. In fact, he was so wicked that Amos couldn't take it anymore because what he did, he set up, he set up temples other than Jerusalem where worshiping the Canaanite gods was, was practiced. And what happened is when they did that, they, they literally... Uh, fell into debauchery, where they sold the, the, uh, the Israelites into slavery for just a pair of shoes. That's how, that's how, uh, how uh, it was. And, they, and so Amos couldn't take it anymore, and he comes up and he, and he goes up to Bethel, where one of these shrines are, and he begins to preach these messages. Now, uh, I want us to look at Amos uh, 1, verses 1 and 2. OK, and we're going to unpack this for a bit. And I think you're going to find this very interesting. So it starts out the words of Amos. Now, this is very interesting because if you look at the prophets, they didn't start out with the words of whatever the prophet's name was. How did it normally start? The word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. And so when people read this, they say, well, look, Amos is just 
All he's doing is speaking for himself. He has no authority. Ah, but you fail to miss, and you'll never understand this unless you understand the Hebrew word. So we're going to talk about this. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, we've talked about that word, which he saw. How do you see words? That's right. He see, but, but there's something very interesting. That word hasa, if for saw, the word there is the Hebrew word hasa, and you find this in several other places, and there's only one other place that you can really see it, and that's in Jeremiah 23, 18. And in Jeremiah 23, 18, uh, Jeremiah asked, who, who among the council can see the council of God, by the way? This was a heavenly council. This was not an earthly council. Who among the council of God can see and hear the words? That's the question that, that Jeremiah asked. And what we understand is that Amos actually had access to this heavenly council. That's what the word Hasa means. He had access to this heavenly council. And I'll give you a perfect example. If you were to go to 1 Kings 22, there is the story of three characters, Jehoshaphat, Ahab, and Micaiah. Now, Jehoshaphat was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Ahab was the king of the northern kingdom, which was Israel. And these were very wicked kings. They were not nice kings. And Ahab wanted to go against the king at uh, Ramoth Gilead. And so Jeho he asked Jehoshaphat to join him in that campaign. So Jehoshaphat uh, rides up to the northern kingdom and he says to the, he says to him, look, before we go down, I want to make sure that God is on our side. So do you, can we bring out the prophets and see what they say? So, uh, so Ahab brought out 400 false prophets. And these 400 prophets were what I call yes men. They said, yes, you can go down to Ramoth Gilead and you're going to be successful. But Jehoshaphat wasn't quite convinced. And so he asked this question, who among all the prophets of Israel can tell us the truth? And so Ahab, well, he said, I've got this one prophet down here. We got him in prison. His name is Micaiah. But I don't like what he has to say. He never tells me good things. And so they brought Micaiah out. And Micaiah, the first thing he does, now he's in chains. The first thing he does is start making fun of all the prophets. He's making sarcastic fun. And Ahab, see, I told you, this guy will not tell me the truth. But he does tell the truth. And so, uh, and so uh, Ahab was just frustrated with him, and one of the guards slapped him. And he says, okay, you want to get serious? And then he says, at beginning in verse 19, verse uh, 19 through 22, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and the host of heaven was surrounded him, some on his right and some on his left. And the Lord said, who will go down to Ramoth Gilead and destroy Ahab? Well, some said this, and some said that. But a spirit of the Lord came forward and said, I will go down to Ramoth Gilead. And, and, and the Lord said, how so? And he said, I will put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets. And so he put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets. And guess what? The prophet said, oh, yeah, go on down. The Lord is going to be with you. And you're going to win. Well, did he? Well, uh, in the in the few verses later, we find that Ahab was killed. He died. In fact, he died a coward's death. So, and what my point is is that this prophet had access to the council of God, and so did Amos. That gave him the authority to speak by that very thing. Now, let's read on which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, which would be Jeroboam II, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Now, this earthquake is mentioned two years before it happened, so this is a prediction. And it's going to help us understand what this lion's roar is all about. 
There's actually three things about the lion's roar, which we're going to read in verse two. But uh, but the but the earthquake is mentioned in Zechariah the 14th chapter, the fifth verse. This earthquake actually happened two years after Amos predicted it. And and then in verse two he says, and the Lord uh, roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. Now, Zion and Jerusalem, what do you think they are? Anyone? No, they're the same, they're the same, they're the same uh, entity, they're the same city. Zion is Jerusalem, okay? But uh, the Lord roars from Jerusalem, okay? And the pastors of the shepherds mourn. What do you think that means? This is going to give us a hint of what this lion's roar is about. The, the, the pastures of the shepherds mourn. Well, if you go to Amos 9.3, it tells us that the vegetation died. It died, just died. And the top of Mount Carmel withers. Now, there's that, that word for wither is a Hebrew word, which means it dried up with a drought. So what's the hint? What does it tell us that this roar is all about? A drought. This drought's about to take over. Now, there's going to be an earthquake. That's part of the roar. There's going to be a drought. That's the second part. There's going to be a third part. And we're going to see that in a minute where there you have the invasion of the nations. Okay? The invasion of the nations is going to happen. Okay? So... Now, the question is, when you look at God's roar, what you see is that this roar starts from Jerusalem and it withers the whole earth. There's cosmic calamity taking place when this roar happens. It's not just in Jerusalem. It's not just in Bethlehem. It's among all the nations of the world at that time. And uh, and here's how in, in... I wrote this, so I want to read it the way I wrote it, because this is how Amos does it. You know, as the sound advanced from Zion, that is Jerusalem, against the nations, it would shrivel and scorch the whole earth. And to the south, the pastures near Bethlehem would dry up as the terrified roar passed through Judah and continued through Gaza, Edom, and Moab. Uh, and northward, the fertile south and west slopes of Mount Carmel. In fact, that was some of the choicest pasture lands of all of Israel. Uh, that, and, and you can see this in Isaiah 33, 9, by the way. It would wither and die as the heat weight of God's wrath moved on to engulf Damascus and Ammon. Everywhere the sound passed, the ground cracked. The vegetation would die. Rivers would dry up. Streams would dry up. Water wells would dry up. So now the question is, why would God send this roar, this wrath? Why would he do that? Sin. Well, that, that's true. But there's, uh, there's a word that, uh, that, that uh, Amos uses this, and we find this beginning in the third verse transgressions. Now we need to understand what that word means. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, there are three words for sin. We need to understand that. The word he uses for transgression is the Hebrew word pesha. Pesha means rebellion against the covenant. Now the question is, how if how, what was the covenant that, that the nations rebelled against? And what was the covenant that Israel rebelled against? The Ten Commandments. Huh? The Ten Commandments. No, no, that wasn't the covenant. No, the covenant wasn't the, co- that, that wasn't the commandments. The no, wasn't that. I, I, in fact, I gave it. In, in fact, that's one of your questions in, in the uh, deal. And I gave you a hint. In order to understand the covenant of the nations, we have to go to Genesis 9, verses 1 through 17, especially verses 5 through 7. And this is what we call the Noahic covenant. That is the covenant between Abraham and the nations. 
Now we see what those nations are in chapter 10 of Genesis, but look at chapter nine, verses five through seven. He who sheds a man's blood breaks the covenant. The nations had shed men's blood. And so God is coming after the nations. Now, why did God come after Israel? What covenant did they break? We have to go to Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4, and also Exodus 19, verses 5 through 6. In Exodus uh, 12, 1 through 4, God gives a covenant to Abraham. And what was that covenant? That they shall be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And if you go to Exodus, the 19th chapter, verses 5 and 6, it says they are to be a priest a priesthood to all the nations and bless those nations. And Israel had failed to do so. And so God's wrath is now coming against not only the nations for breaking Noah's covenant, but also Abraham's covenant for Israel. And if you notice, this is very important. Now, this is also a question that you have. If you notice how the roar starts, it starts in the north and the northeast corner of Israel, and it goes down to the southwest, and then it starts up in the southeast corner, and then it goes to the southwest, and there's a crisscross. There's a line. It, it almost puts a bullseye right in the middle of Israel. Why does it do that? And this is purposely done. The way that these, uh, these nations are listed in chapters one and two, it creates that crisscross with Israel right in the crosshairs. Why does it do that? Why do you think it does that? What it does is he starts naming all the sins of the nations, and then Israel is put in there and every sin that the nations had, Israel has doubled it. They have doubled it. So all these sins of the nations, and we're going to look at some of these, we're going to see that, uh, that, that, that Israel also doubled it. Now, uh, let's look at, um, uh, let's look at, uh, oh, I meant to tell you this. Uh Pesha is one of the sins, that, and what that means is that they, they broke the covenant. That's the word, that's what it means. There's another word for sin, and that is kata. Kata in the Bible means human failure. In fact, uh, most of the Bible, uh, most of the Old Testament speaks of human failure. These are sins that will not send you to hell. In other words, whenever you stepped on a dead animal... You were made un unclean. You were made impure in the Old Testament. And so what was the remedy to fix that? You went through a purification ritual. In order to uh, occupy sacred space, that is, where God camped. When God would make these the camp in the wilderness and when he made the temple, that was considered sacred space. Okay, you could not come to God if you were impure, not that you sinned. That's not that's not true. God allowed sinners to come before him. It was that you had to be made pure. In fact, we see this in Isaiah, the, uh, the first chapter where uh, where he, you know, Isaiah goes into the temple. And what happens to the seraphim? What does he do? He puts a coal to his lip to make him pure pure. The impurity from Isaiah goes from that, from his lips to the coal itself, and it makes him pure. So the sin offering that you see in the Old Testament had nothing to do with saving you. It was to make those that are impure to be pure. That was called the kata offering. And then there's another one called a wand. Now, a wand is iniquity. That is the word we get for moral iniquity. In other words, you pervert what is, what is good. So sexuality, sexuality was given to mankind as a good thing. But what does man do with it? He perverts it into all sorts of deviations. 
into every kind of imaginable thing, bestiality, incense, own and own and own. This is all a perversion of that. And those are the three words that are used. Now, if you go to Ephesians, the second chapter, verses one through three, Paul uses three words. He speaks of, he speaks of um, trespasses, he speaks of sin, and he speaks of disobedience. Those three words are the same words that the Old Testament uses for Avon, Kata, and uh, Pesha. And what does he say? The way he sets this up, he, he says, man's sins are found in these three areas, his disobedience, his human failure, and his iniquity, his perversion of what is good. And then he goes on, but God's mercy is greater. And the way he sets this up is that Pesha, or the man's iniquities, man's uh, human failures, and man's uh, transgression against the covenant are on one side of the scale. Right now, that scale is heavy laden. It, 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 it is greater than anything else. But God's mercy comes along and it lays it on this side of the scale. And all of a sudden, God's mercy overcomes man's sin. And that's how Paul puts it in Ephesians 1, uh, verse, I mean, excuse, Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. Okay. So let's look at uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. We're going to just unpack this. Now, there are, there are, this is mentioned uh, seven times to the nations and once to Israel. Listen how it's set up. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, for Damascus and for four. What does that mean? Notice that is the pattern for the next seven times in chapters one and two. Okay, here's what it means. What are three and four? What does that add up to? Seven. seven. What is the number seven in, in the Bible? Perfection, completion, wholeness. Okay, it was a sacred number of ancient Hebrew. It was a very sacred number of ancient Hebrew. Three plus four are the sins of the nations. And what it means is that the, that the, nations, uh, uh, that the nations had reached their zenith where all the sins they had done had, had uh, overflowed to the point that God had enough. So would that read for three transgressions of Damascus and for four transgressions? And for the four, and for the fourth one. Oh, just the fourth one. Fourth one. Four more. No, not four mm -hmm. more, for, for the fourth one. But, but this is amazing. Amos does 49 messages. That's the number, that is a, a product of the number seven. Seven times seven is 49. And each message is broken down into seven parts. And so he uses this number seven throughout. Now there's one part in which he, in which he uses 14 times it's used, which is division of seven. Seven is a very important number in Amos. And it's, and it's not something that speaks positively of something. It speaks negatively of something. It means the nations have reached their zenith and their sins are complete, and God has had enough, and he's not going to turn back his punishment. That's what it means. He's not going to turn back his punishment. And that's why it says, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke. In fact, the word is actually, I will not turn back. That word punishment is not there. What do you have in yours? Do you all have punishment? I will not turn back. I will not turn back. That's what it says. The implication is he will not turn back his punishment, his wrath, the lion's roar. He will not turn that back. That's what it's going by. And then it goes, and so this is the nation of Damascus, or this is the sin of Damascus, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. You know what a, a, a threshing floor was in Israel's day? It was a flat rock usually a big round rock, a huge rock, about uh, probably the size of this room, okay? And they would have these threshing mats. 
And these threshing mats were six by eight and they would have these spikes in them. And the spikes would go down between a quarter of an inch to half an inch. And they would throw stalk on it with seed and they throw it on this flat rock and they would uh, take oxen and they would drag this threshing match over this flat rock and it would separate the seed from the stalk. Here's what they did. This is what Damascus had done. They had taken that same threshing mat. They would capture slaves of nations, throw them on the rock and run that threshing match over their backs. Tear them up. This was the sin that broke the camel's back for, for, uh, for God. God said, I've had enough. See, that is the violation of the Noahic covenant. They were killing people, shedding blood and doing it in the most horrible ways. Okay. Uh, now let's look at verses. At, and by the way, you'll notice that uh, this, this pattern is the same pattern. He says, uh, uh, you know, for three transgressions and for four. And then he says, you know, uh, I will send fire. For three transgressions and for four, I will send fire. That word fire is the same word that we get when you go to uh, Genesis 19. What happened in Genesis 19? Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. He is going to wipe these nations. And what happened to Sod Sodom and Gomorrah? He made it where it was uninhabitable. The fire was made where it was uninhabitable. God's <laughs> wrath is about to come and make these nations uninhabitable. That's what the word fire means. It's the Hebrew word esh. And it's the same word that's used in, in Genesis uh, uh, 19 verse, I believe, 6. So, all right. But he's going to use that same pattern. So let's look at, uh, let's look at Amos 1, 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, Gaza, and for four, I will not turn back my punishment, because they have carried into exile a whole people. Now, that word for whole there is a Hebrew word called shalem. We get our word shalom from. What is shalom? Peace. Peace. These were peaceful people. They took whole nations of peaceful people. And what did they do? They delivered them up to Edom. They sold them into slavery. Now, here is how most nations did when they took slaves. They would only take the kings, the princes, and the smart people, the elite. And they would take them into exile. But in this case, Gaza, they would take all the nations, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, it didn't matter, slaves, they would take them all and they would sell them into exile so that the nation would no longer exist. You know, when Israel was taken by the Babylonians into exile, what happened? They only took the elite, took people like Daniel, who was smart, smart people. They left a lot of people in, uh, in Jerusalem in tatters, but they left them. In this case, they took the entire nation and destroyed it. Okay. So let's look at, uh, let's look at, uh, it, 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 let's look at Amos 1, 9 through 10. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they delivered up again the whole people of Edom and did not remember the covenant of the brotherhood. Now, what does that mean? The covenant of the brotherhood. Anybody? Take a guess. What did we just talk about? What covenant did they break? Noah's. They broke Noah's covenant. They were not loyal to Noah's covenant. That's the covenant of brotherhood. That's what he's talking about. And again, he will send fire upon the wall of Tyre. When you send fire upon the wall of Tyre, which was the thing that fortified them from their enemies, what happens when the wall comes down? The enemies can walk in and take over. 
And that's exactly what they did. This is the same sin uh, that 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 uh, that uh, uh, was done in Gaza. You know, it's interesting that uh, in Gaza they took them up to Edom in captivity, and then Edom suffered the same. That's right. They did. Yeah. All the nations, they're not going to get off at all. God's about to wipe them all out. That's what he's going to do. He's going to wipe every one of them off the face of the earth because he's had enough. He's had enough. All right. Uh, look at, uh, let's look at uh, verses uh, 11 through 12 of chapter one. Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity and his anger toward perpetually and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send fire upon Teman and shall devour the strongholds of Basra. Now, what does it mean because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity? Uh, went after him and, and killed everybody, didn't take no prisoners. Yep, same thing. They didn't take any prisoners. Except, what is the brothers uh, uh, with the sword? What brothers would that be? Edom was a brother of Israel. Remember, Edom, is, this goes back to Genesis. This was one of Abraham's grandsons was one of Abraham's grandson. And so they were blood kin. And so the kinfolk of Israel was uh, was going to literally destroy the whole nation. That was their goal. Now, did they destroy the whole nation? No, no, they didn't. But that's what they wanted. There's always a remnant. Yeah, there's always the remnant. That's true. So... All right, let's, uh, let's look at uh, verses 13 through 15. For three transgressions of the Ammonites, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have ripped open. This is very obvious what this is. They have ripped open pregnant women in Gilead that they might enlarge their border. That's pretty gruesome. They literally took the pregnant women so that the nation couldn't populate. This is the purpose. They didn't want the nation to populate. And they would rip open those pregnant women. Uh, and, and of course, it would kill the child as well as the, uh, as well as the woman itself. You know, in the reading of this, we don't really get a concept of what period of time that took place. That no, we don't. That must have been quite a period. Yeah. No, yeah, because Amos was actually written, it was actually, his prophecies were over a period of years. And these are collected by, by, uh, by the Jews and put together in this way. And uh, we don't know, we don't know exactly all, we know a few of the dates. We know a few of the dates, but we don't know all the dates. And some of these, we don't, we don't, we we don't even know the uh, area in which he was speaking about. Right, but for this to impact that nation, they would have had to have done this over a period. Of oh yeah, it was. From... Yeah, it, yeah. This didn't happen overnight. This isn't anything that happened overnight. Yeah, no. Amos Amos didn't come in here and he, and he gave this whole speech all at once. He spoke these in segments. He would go and preach and then head back down to the south, go back up to, uh, up to Israel, preach and head back down to the south. And then the Jewish community was the one that gathered all of Amos's speeches and put it together in the form we have it today. I'm surprised they didn't go after him like they went after Jesus. They did. Oh, okay. They did go after him. Yes. Oh, they hated him. This is 800 BC, 800 to 750 BC. Is about the time. Yep. Roughly about the time. Yeah, they hated him. Believe me, uh, Jeroboam II did not like Amos. It's, it becomes apparent in some of the passages we'll look at later. All right, uh, let's look at verses. Uh, uh, let's look at verses. Um, uh, uh, this is Amos uh, 2, verses 1 and 3. Okay, we're going to look at Moab. For three transgressions of Moab, for four, I will not revoke the punishment. Because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom, 
Now look what Edom did. Edom took slaves. But in this case, Moab is going to go after the king of Edom. Edom was a brother of Israel, was kinfolk to Israel. So I will send fire upon Moab, and it will devour the strongholds of Kiriah. And Moab shall uh, die amid uproar, amid shouting and the sound of the trumpet. And I will cut off the ruler from its midst, and I will kill all its princesses with him, says the Lord. Pretty gruesome what God's going to do. This guy, uh, Edom, wanted to go after Moab, kill all the kings. What happens when you kill the kings of a nation? No leadership. What happens when there's no leadership? Chaos. That's right. That's right. Huh? got the United States as a chaos. Well, this brings up the important part, and I know this is one of the questions. You know, think about what God is doing to the judgment today. And uh, this is going to be a, this will be one of our discussions that we, you know, we can talk about. What is God doing? Do you think uh, today to, uh, to uh, uh, bring judgment? Breaking down all of these norms that we have. Oh yeah, yeah. I believe you're right. There are many different ways we can go with that question. There is no right. Yeah, there is no right. We have abandoned all truth. We made it all subjective feeling. You know, what I feel is what's truth. Doesn't matter what you feel, it's what I feel. Doesn't matter what's really happening to you. No, it doesn't matter what's in the real world. My truth determines what's real. So if I think I'm a boy, I mean, if I think I'm a girl, I'm a girl. How ridiculous. Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, they haven't felt the difference in the kick from a bull and a heifer. <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what, when I was working on a dairy farm, and got kicked by them heifers. I didn't know, think that I knew any different at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I tell you, there's nothing worse than a dairy bull. Oh. They are mean. <laughs> yeah. What about a Bramer bull? Mm. But you know, Bramers are. But I'll tell you what, dairy bulls, <laughs> they are something else. You think it'd be pretty tranquil with all these cows around? Well, you would think so, but it is not. I was training the dairy team one time, and we went to Tarleton, and they let us practice judge one afternoon. And so we climbed over in this pen. There was there was a dairy bull there. You moved in there. You moved in there. Before long, the we were climbing over the pen <laughs> because he was. We we need to wrap up real quick, guys. Uh, uh, I want us to get to, I want us to look at uh, Israel real quick. So let's look at Amos, the second chapter, verses 16, 6 through 16. And I'm going to go through this real quick. Uh, for three transgressions and for four, because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. This is where they sell their own people for as a low of a price as a pair of sandals. Mm -hmm. wow. Now, there are seven sins. Again, the number seven. There are seven sins mentioned in these verses for Israel. What happened in the year of Jubilee with these things? Well, Jubilee was every 49 years. Oh, well, no, when they uh, released all the slaves. Yeah, they didn't do that. I see that no, they didn't do that. No, they, they, they violated, they did, they violated their covenant with Abraham, okay? That's what they were supposed to do, yeah. but they didn't do it. They didn't do it, no, they didn't. They sold them, they sold them into slavery again, okay? For, for as little as a pair of shoes, okay? And those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn 
aside the way of the afflicted. And here's another sin. And a man and his father go to the same girl so that my holy name is profane. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. You know what the uh, what the uh, Hebrew understanding of a, of a poor man's garment? You never take his garment for collateral, for a loan. I thought you could, but you couldn't keep it over. Nope. You had to give it back. You had to give it back. They didn't do that. They kept it. And they laid down with prostitutes in the temple of God. This is how bad they got. That's what they did. You know what's sad is they had to know that was happening and they did it anyway. They did it anyway. Turned a blind eye. These people had become wicked. Israel was, I mean, let's face it, Israel was constantly failing at everything they did, and God still loved them. That's amazing. His mercy was greater. If you know, if you go to Exodus 34, 6 and 7, he says he will forgive. Pesha, that word Pesha, he will forgive iniquity, that word, that word for Vaughn, and he will forgive uh, outright failure, that is that word Kata. Says he will forgive that. And he did over and over and over again for Israel. For the thrill? Huh? For the thrill? For God forgive for the thrill. No, God, God's mercy is so great that he will forgive. I'm sorry. No, yeah, God's mercy is so great and so, so beyond anything we can imagine that he will forgive outright rebellion and iniquity and grace. sin. Huh? Can't understand grace. You know, grace is just amazing what he does. But the wrath was the consequence. You know, That's right. It was the consequence. Uh, look at verse nine. Yet it was I who... I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars and who was as strong as the oaks. What does it mean that they, the Amorites were as height, of, had this height of cedar? They were tall people, but where did they come from? Go back to Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4. Genesis 6, 1 through 4 says that the sons of God came into the daughter's men and married them, and they bore giants. They were called the Nephilim. They bore giants. These were hybrid angels and hybrid humans. And if you go to Deuteronomy, if you go to the first chapter of Deuteronomy, uh, immediately Israel is confronted with it. They were supposed to go over to, uh, to the promised land and wipe out these giants. It mentions that. And they were so afraid that God said, okay, you don't want to do it? I'm going to send you in the wilderness for 40 years. And we're going to wipe out that whole generation. And we're going to bring up a generation that will go in there and wipe them out. And so they, 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 uh, they're they on the east side of Jordan in which they were sent to the wilderness. They were at the east side of Jordan when they were supposed to go in the promised land. And God brings them back to the same spot 40 years later. And they go in and they wipe out all the giants, but one city, the city of I, the city of I, and they didn't do that. And guess what? Out of the city of I, the Ammonites came, and these were the giant, the leftover giants that they didn't wipe out. They didn't wipe out at all. The flood was supposed to wipe out most of them, but they didn't, didn't wipe them all out. They Appeared again, and the Ammonites were these giants, were these Nephilim. And guess who ended up wiping them all out? Out of the city, from the city of Ai. It was Gaza. It was the city of Gath. Who was the one that wiped them out? David. David wiped them out when he killed Goliath and his four brothers. He didn't just kill Goliath. He went in and, and killed the four brothers. And that's what he, that was the purpose of that fight. They needed to wipe out the giants. That's why he picked up not one stone. Five. five. That's correct. You're absolutely right. Wow. Where is that? It, 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 I never really thought about that. That's why. Jerry had it right. Where is that written? Uh, that's in 1 Samuel, I think, the uh, 19th chapter. So it talks about him telling the other four. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So these Ammonites were these giants. And uh, and 
they were to wipe them out. And you know, the archaeologists, you know, uh, pe people call this holy scripture that the Lord has given us fantasy. But yet, <laughs> archaeologists keep finding, and they have found the skeletons of these giants that David killed. They have found the skeletons and they were the exact measurement that the Holy Scripture gives us. When they measured the skeletons, put together the skeletons, there that there was. Mm. Mm. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> How big they were, they? In fact, he goes on and says, I, just, I, 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 uh, I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. When you destroy the fruit above and the roots beneath, what happens? You wipe them out. They're gone. Okay. Now, this is God talking to Israel, reminding them what he had done for them. Okay. Uh, also, it was I who brought you out of the land of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to possess a land of the Amorite. Again, the giant clan, okay? And raise up some of your sons for prophets and some of your young men for Nazar Nazarites. Is it not? And who was a Nazarite in the Old Testament? Samson. Oh, yeah. Samson was a Nazarite. And what was he supposed to do? What was a Nazarite not supposed to do? There were two things he was not supposed to do. Drink Cut his hair, drink hair. and drink of the vine. Yep. No alcohol. But again, looky here, verse 12. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, you shall not prophesy. He's speaking about Amos right here. This is where uh, this they're speaking about Amos. Behold, I will press you down in your place as a cart full of sheaves presses down. Flight, uh, flight shall perish with the swift and the strong shall not retain his strength, nor shall the might, mighty save his life. He who handles the bow shall not stand. That is, they had these Benjamite archers at this time. These Benjamite <laughs> archers uh, were the ones that, that Israel would use to, uh, to handle the bow. Uh, he, he who handles the bow shall not stand. He won't be able to stand against what God is about to do to him. And he who is swift of foot shall not save himself. These were the foot, foot soldiers. Nor shall he who rides the horse save his life. These were the people that rode the horses into, uh, into battle. And he who is stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in the day the, the, that the Lord declares. Okay. Rise up, the Lord is calling. Rise up, this is.